Corporation of the Community College of Baltimore. And now by recording from New York, WBJC presents Inside Gene Shepherd. Somehow the idea of W.C. Fields eating Fritos is grotesque. <laughs> Ever seen that commercial? Only a see Fritos, yeah? I mean, that's one of the major grotesqueries of our time. It's like uh, picturing W.C. Fields drinking a diet tab. Only a see Fields and a little glass of tab of my Fritos. I mean, where will it ever end, for God's sakes? Bring it up, please, will you, Bill, please? Can't leave the slobs off the hook. Bring it up there. Don't you feel kind of good once in a while, deep down in your gut, that you are a slob? I mean, the slob world is so full of passion and, and uh, slobbish delights. Sitting there stuffing your face with cheeseburgers and going to the Dairy Queen and hanging around the Great Easter. And, you know, you know it's, just a, it's just a... <laughs> oh, the life of the peasant has always been rich and full. You ever think in terms of the slob being the modern-day peasant? <laughs> That's tonight's salute to Jersey. Yeah, so, well, uh, of course, I'm not, I, I, no value judgment involved. I, I never make a value judgment, of course. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I, yeah, who was it who once said, uh, the world, God must have loved the slobs. He made so many of them. Uh, no, no, he didn't say that, did he? No, no. No, that wasn't God. That was, in, that was Earl Wilson. That was a quote from his column. Or was it Dorothy Kilgallen? I don't, uh, I, I don't know whose literary style that is. But, you know, speaking of literary styles, uh, uh, tonight uh, I have a, something uh, I don't often do here. I have a letter here. It says, uh, Shepherd. Uh, it's, you know, it starts right out there. It, uh, Shepard says, this letter concerns your show about insomnia a few nights ago. I will make it short and avoid trying to be humorous since I'm not a professional. <laughs> yes, I can see. I was never in the Army, but after listening to you for the past several years, I feel as though I have been. I'll take your word for it about Army lectures, putting you to sleep and being a fantastic cure for insomnia. Your show did a good job that night. Well, thank you. However, I feel you have overlooked the greatest cure for insomnia, much older than any Army lecture cure. I will come right to the point. The greatest and most successful cure for insomnia is to recall the church sermons of one's youth. You know, he says, one hour plus of total slumber producing oratory. In my youth, I learned the very difficult art of sleeping Hours on end with my eyes wide open, with an apparently interested stare. This is, uh, now, this is quite true. I might say that this guy hit on something, and I, and I have to give full credit to this listener. He's right. He says, uh, he says, they were, he says, I, he says, it bothered me for years. He says, you know how people talk about how they can't get to sleep? He says, a couple of really, uh, a really authentically recorded sermons from any one of 12,000 churches played on your stereo would be enough to put uh, even the canary to sleep. Well, now, <laughs> now, this is not a comment on religion, although it could be taken as that. It is primarily a comment on delivery. Oh, yes. Do you realize that the average Presbyterian minister, if he were given some of the major speeches from Henry IV, would put you to sleep instantly? Now, is that a comment on Shakespeare? Is it a comment on delivery? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I discovered this This guy is absolutely the true. Um, so, he's so true that, it's, that's a, that it, it's, a, it's a painful recollection that I have in, in connection with a very... Have you ever done something that was so embarrassing, 
so completely embarrassing that even at this point, and maybe 150 years after the embarrassing event occurred, you still have great difficulty in admitting that it happened. <laughs> I mean, have you ever had that? <laughs> Oh, listen, I want to tell you, I, I've seen some unbelievable moments of that type. I mean, where, where, where even it was so embarrassing at the time that people didn't even mention it at the time. It was so terrible, embarrassing. I, 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 uh, I, I one time was out on a double date with a guy. This happens to be a true story. This is not fiction tonight, Brian. This is the absolute God's honest, painful truth. But I was out with a, with a guy, and the two of us were with these two girls. And we drove, uh, you know, we drove all half, halfway across the city, Chicago, a long drive. And we, we, got, we got to the show we were going to. We went to the show, right? It was at the Oriental Theater. If you're curious about this kind of movie house, it was. It was a fantastic movie house. It had, a, had, a, had an imitation sky above it. Have you ever gone into a movie house where they have stars? And the clouds going by, and oh, it's fantastic! And and, and since it was it was well known that in Chicago you could go for as long as six or seven months without seeing the sky, because of the blast furnace and all of, all the you know all the steel mills and all that jazz. So people would go to the Oriental Theater just to see the sky. Well, you'd sit there, you had the picture, the hell with the picture. You'd sit there and look up there and watch the clouds go by. Yeah, they had some kind of a technique. I don't know how they did it, but it looked like clouds going by. Do you ever see this there? And, and it had stars up there. And there were, there were what looked like flights of, of seagulls that were up in the, star, in the stars and the clouds. They, and they were hanging. Yeah, it was a fantastic scene. It was really, very real. And you'd sit in this, in this gigantic theater. Well, I'll give you another idea how this theater was. You see, this is a this is let's put it this way: it was the kind of theater that uh, that when you went into the lobby, it was all brass. You know, it's fantastic. Uh, uh, had these uh, imitation bronze bas reliefs. Uh, it was sort of neo Greeky, come late uh, uh, third dynasty Egyptian was roughly what the architecture was, which kind of fitted in great with the south side of Chicago. And it was very, very exciting. And uh, you'd come into this place and it had, had, uh, had all kinds of colored purple and green and blue tiles on the, on, the, on the floor of the lobby. Magnificent. I mean, I'm not talking about tiles like in the John. I'm talking about decorative tiles, you know, swans. And <laughs> we'd come into this place, see, and, and uh, we'd go there and the, to, just to see the place. And in the, in the front of the uh, lobby was the, was the box office. Now, this was really a true kiosk. And it was made out of, apparently carved out of solid bronze. And this old lady with gray hair would sit in there and sell tickets at an exorbitant rate. And uh, you'd come in there and buy these tickets. You'd move into this place. And right in the middle of the lobby, to me, this has always been a, a, the epitome of the movie world. They had a, a, a pool. And it was, it was lined with, with deep uh, royal purple uh, glazed tiles. It just looked beautiful. It was a great big pool. And it had water in it. And in the water were about 400 great, big, fat, mean-looking goldfish. You ever go into a movie that had an actual pool in it? They had a goldfish swimming around there. And, uh, <laughs> and there were a couple of, couple of swans. They actually had swans in there. And the swans are moving around in this place. And, and people would come crowding in there. And being South Chicago, that was not enough, you see, because uh, naturally, as I say, the slob is always with us, ever-present. And uh, to those of you who think that uh, that ecological uh, debauchery is a new thing, I can only say that here was this pool in the in the lobby of the Oriental Theater. It had all these uh, great-looking goldfish swimming around in it, and it had water. See, because the goldfish wouldn't work it. They couldn't hack it without the water. See, there was water in there, and there was also these swans. But we'd go in and we'd look in the goldfish. See, everybody would wait because you had to wait till the end of the second feature before they let you in. You know, these purple ropes and all that jazz. We're standing there. We're looking at the swans. And the entire water was covered with Wrigley gum wrappers. <laughs> Wrigley gum wrappers and the old uh, butt ends of Baby Ruth candy bars. And uh, you'd see the uh, goldfish swimming around there looking at the Baby Ruth candy bars. And it, it just sort of was a, the whole thing was kind of a cross section of the whole movie world. On one end, you see these, these elegant swans and they're swimming through a sea of spearmint wrappers. 
I mean, you know, it kind of captured the whole, the whole, uh, the whole mood. You know, the the profane and the the sublime all in one giant pool. There it was, you know. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, uh, we we went to this movie house. And I, now I don't know, um, you know, I really don't know why I'm telling you this because. Uh, we all know that uh, since we are all of us in one way or another wallowing in the slob world, and uh, it's it's really our culture, we have to accept it, that uh, me and this guy went to this movie house this day. See, well, it's night. You got the scene, right? I, I, I really don't, I don't want to tell you this embarrassing moment because it may embarrass some of you. And uh, I, I'll tell you this right away. Uh, it's in bad taste. Invariably, the best embarrassing moments are. And let's face another thing. Life itself is in bad taste. I mean, uh, anyone who, who looks at life with a cold, unprejudiced, agate eye of truth must realize that life is basically in, 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 in extremely bad taste. If you felt this, Bill, or have you felt all along it's been your life that's been in <laughs> remarkably bad taste? Or do you think that George Plimpton lives on another plane of existence, you know, sipping at daffodils, and his pen is dipped in the in the uh, you, you kind of like this, huh? His pen is dipped in uh, in the elegant uh, nectar of truth, whereas you fool around with that lousy ballpoint that keeps squirting purple ink on your knees, right? Well, so uh, life has to be that way. La da da dee 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 dee. La da da dee 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 dee. What am I doing? What, what is that? No, no, come on now. That's not a hip version of American the Beautiful. What is it? ring a ding 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 ring a ding 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 ring a ding 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 Oh, God. ring a ding 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 you know, it's falling all apart. I really think, you know, speaking of life slowly disintegrating, uh, I, I suppose you want me to finish this embarrassing. You notice I'm, I'm being very careful about not finishing a series because of the, the disastrous thing that happened at night. Well, we were with these two girls, okay? And uh, well, the, actually, the girl that I was with was a girl who worked down in the office. You know how, um, how there's always a couple of girls that work in the office at school? And, uh, you know, they, they're from some uh, very alien, distant class, like they're taking uh, home economics or something. I never, I, I just knew this girl. So she was in the office all the time. So one time I finally got up the guts to ask her for a date. I was always in the office, in and out all the time. Uh, you could always tell how much trouble a kid was in in our school by the amount of time he spent in the office. I was not in the office making inquiries about paying lab fees. I was usually summoned to the office summarily and uh it was always a bad scene and so i got since i did spend quite a bit of time in the waiting room in the office waiting to see the eichmann of our school a man named mr rupp he was the hatchet man see he always used to say yeah whenever 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 you were in real trouble you would be summoned to speak to mr rupp i don't know whatever else else he did he was always in this little office off of the office and uh he would sit at his desk, and he had this kindly look. That's the worst part about hatchet men. They, they generally have worked hard on having a friendly, kindly, disarming look. And he used to sit there and smile, smoke a pipe. And uh, he'd say, well, now, what seems to be the trouble today? Let's see. Let's see. What seems to be the trouble? You've been here before, haven't you? It's good to see you again. Let's see. Let's see. Ah, oh, ha, ha. I see. Little, little situation arose in the Miss McCullough's class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> George. <laughs> well, 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 well. <laughs> yes, sir. Miss McCullough, according to this note, says that you were fighting in class. <laughs> well, I can understand that. Fighting in class. Well, how do you like Miss McCullough? She's a nice lady, isn't she? And you're sitting there. See, he's sneaking up on you. I'll tell you what it's roughly like. It's like if a tiger in the jungle sends you an invitation to uh, have a drink with him. 
and then sits around for a while, and, and you both discuss Jim Beam bourbon. And he's sitting there grinning. He says, well, <laughs> George, uh, let me hear your side of it. Mm-hmm. By this time, you know, you figure he's your friend. And the, oh, this is worst. This is a worst technique. Uh, this this is terrible. He says, "No, look, you know, I know Miss McCullough. She goes off the deep end sometimes. You know, I tell you. Yes, uh, well, you know, she's getting along. And uh, let's hear your side of it. I said, well, <laughs> my first couple of times, see, I fell for it. I says, well, you're right about Miss McCullough. You know, I'm sitting there in the back, and and uh, you know this guy Farkas. Uh, Say, oh, Farkas, yes, he's been in here several times. Farkas, uh, is he in your class? <laughs> well, you know, Farkas. Well, anyway, the next thing you know, he and I are shoving around back there, and at the, he fell over sideways and, and hit the cabinets in the back and knocked over this globe we got there. And, and you know how Miss McCullough is. She got all excited and started to, started to cry and everything like that. And Farkas got up, and, and uh, he tripped over the, the desk there. And, and uh, well, you know, you know, she just, he said, thanks, and well... <laughs> yeah, well, uh, very interesting story. I can understand that that would happen. I know that stuff like that happened to me all the time when I was in school. All right, uh, you go back to your homeroom, and uh, we'll uh, we'll talk to Miss McCollin straight it out. Well, the first time I left the office, I felt well. You know, I I, I really put it over that old duffer. I felt great, you know, I walked out of there with like 10 feet tall, so I walked down to the office, whew, boy, because it had been bothering me, because me and, me and the Farkas had a slugging match in English, too, that went on for about 19 minutes, and then finally involved about three other kids, you know, we busted a window, and Farkas said, oh, it was a bad scene, so I figured now I'm through with it, well, I get back to my advisory, my home room, and Miss Snyder is sitting there, my advisor, and she just sitting there, she says, oh, yes, uh, I just uh, received a note from uh, Mr. Rupp, and he also called. I said, well, yeah, you know, we had a talk about the thing that happened there. It's, it's all straightened out. So, uh, it's just you go see Mr. Spohn. Well, that was, you know, that was, you know, the minute you were told to see Spohn, the ball game was over. That meant uh, the next thing, you were on the bus home. Have you ever been suspended? You haven't. Have you, Jerry? Why am I the only... Well, I, I'll never forget the first time I was suspended for three days. And, I, and I, I, I got on the bus, you know, at first it was this great rush of enthusiasm for the whole idea of not having to go to school for three days. <laughs> then halfway home on the bus, it began to hit me. <laughs> I was going to explain this. And you know how I tried to do it? I got home. So my mother says, what are you doing home this early? I said, well, I feel good. Oh, oh, God, my God. Oh, something wrong with me. She says, oh, please. And the, and the, she says, oh, come on, quick, get into the bedroom. Did you did you see the school news? Yeah, oh, I'm sick. Oh. And I go tottering into the bedroom. See, and I, I flop over on my bed. And she's, she's running around getting the X-lax and all that stuff. See? And just about the second run into the bathroom, and she's running out with cold rags and I'm laying on the on the bed going, ah, oh, oh. I hear in the next room, I hear, ah, it's the phone, see. Ah. Well, you know, I figure it's Mrs. Bruner calling us. So I'm laying there going, oh, oh. and I hear my mother pick up the phone, yes. Mr. Who? Mr. Rupp. Oh, well, yes, put him on. Oh, God. I'm laying in the bed. Mr. Rupp. He did what? He what? He, yes, he's here now. Three days. Then I hear plunk. Okay. I just got up off the bed, sat on the edge, and I could hear the feet coming. <laughs> you know, thump, 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 thump. <laughs> I will, I will, uh, I will, let's put it this way, mercifully draw the curtain upon the ensuing scene, which I might add is still today a bone of contention between me and my mother. We just don't mention it. Because, you know, one of the worst things that, that my mother used to say, that was Mr. Rupp. 
I'd say, who, who, you know, I still was attempting. And a kid never gives up. You know, who, who? Mr. Rupp, and you know very well who. And you know what he's calling about, right? Well, Mr. Rupp, why? Still, see, if you learn to admit your guilt early in life, people will tend to be kind to you. Do you agree with that, Bill? I mean, how many times have you driven like 87 miles an hour through a 25-mile-an-hour zone, and you see that blue light behind you, and you look out of the car and you say, what's the matter? If you simply say, my foot slipped and it was pushing down, I couldn't get it off the accelerator, help. You know, that, that doesn't work either. If you say, look, all right, okay, I done it. You got me. He's inclined to say, look, fella, will you cut it out? You know? But if you say to him, uh, but the officer, I know I wasn't going more than that. My car's got a governor on it. It can't go more than 22 miles an hour because I put it in myself. It's a... You're liable to find yourself, you know, with, with your hands behind your back. <laughs> You're liable to find them going through the trunk of your car looking for pot. You're liable to find yourself. <laughs> so, you know, to admit your guilt is always a good thing. Well, let's put it this way. It is often a good thing. Sometimes to admit your guilt is only to feed the fires. So you got to use your sense. Whatever sense you got, you got to use it. So I, I, I said to my mother, I said, to, what, what, Mr. Rupp? What, what do you mean? She said, you know very well what I mean. I said, but what do you mean, ma? I persisted. She said, you have been expelled for three days. Expelled? Expelled three days? I never thought a son of mine would be... Oh, God, here we go. This I says, Mom, what do you mean expelled? Oh, my stuff. She says, you are expelled for three days, and I'll tell you what you're going to do for three days. For three days, you're going to do nothing, but you think you're going to get out of work? You're going to clean the basement for the three days. And after that, you're going to clean the, you're going to clean all the closets out. And then you're going to clean the attic out. Three days, any summer. I'm, you're not going to sit around here on your bottom just because you get kicked out of school. And I'll tell you this. And what did your father, oh, my father, what did your father hear? Well, Oh, God. So I tried to atone. You see, when you try to atone for guilt, so I go down into the basement, and the first thing I did was start to clean the basement. If I get out the hoses, you know, I'm squirting down the basement floor, and I'm I'm cleaning out the, the furnace. I got all the ashes pulled out. I'm, I'm down there because, you know, the desire to atone for guilt is very strong in the human. Yes, atoning for guilt is a curious thing, and you, 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 you like to pretend that you're not, uh, you're not that type. You're a total amoralist. But every one of us atones in one way or another. Do you agree with that, Jerry? You're the only religious man among us, and you must agree. Well, yes, yes, it is true. Do you agree that atonement is, is, is a major problem? And I was not a religious man, I'm telling you. So I'm down in the basement working away, you know, it's clean in the basement, and I'm f dust is flying. And then I suddenly hear coming up the driveway, Ow! it's the old man's Oldsmobile. Oh, God. I start to clean even harder. I hear him come up the back steps. I hear the door slam. And then I hear up there, what? What? What the hell? What the hell? And a pop, pop, oh, We will now once again draw the curtain of kindness over the ensuing scene, which occurred next to the coal bit. It was once again, I was once again reminded that the old man was stronger than five bulls. <laughs> I mean, and he must have been one hell of a dropkick artist in his day. He demonstrated it. He caught me on the bounce. And I'll tell you, we had a, we had a go around down in the basement. There. If you think you've seen anything out of Eugene O'Neill, you know, long day's journey at tonight. Well, my old man was not like that old man, you know, who kept sitting around taking this from those kids. I mean, I says, but dad, he said, don't but dad me. Don't but dad me. You got kicked out of school. I but dad. Don't put bad me! You got thrown out of school! And what did you get thrown out of school for? I'll tell you, fighting! I don't mind you fighting out in the backyard, or fighting in the alley, or fighting on the way home back in the garage, but you were fighting in the school, right there, and you got kicked out! Let's see how good you can fight now! Well, it was a very exciting evening.
<laughs> and I remember my kid brother cowering under the day pit when I, when I was dragged kicking and screaming up the basement steps. And I sat down to eat my meatloaf and my red cabbage that night, and it tasted like ashes. Yes, it was atonement. The old man just sat there, you know, shoveling away at his food. And once in a while, he'd look at me, just get that withering look. Kicked out of school. That's stupid. That's stupid. Oh. You, you see, what bugged him was not that I was fighting. But I was dumb enough to do it where I could get caught. That's what bugged him. Stupid fighting in class. Stupid. My mother used to say, well, now let's forget. And she was always trying to throw oil upon the troubled waters. Well, now let's forget it and go right ahead. He's learned his lesson. Oh, I'll bet. Look at him sitting there, learned his lesson. And you know what's worse? He won the fight. If he got the hell kicked out of him, he would have learned a lesson. Boy, my kid brother is out there in the next room under the day bed whimpering because, you see, we had a tendency, as is the case, see, violence spreads. It's just the way it goes. It's, it's a contagious disease. And a kid is under, he understands this. Far more than adults understand it. And, they, and, and and he was afraid that, you know, he would come in and sit down, squat down in front of his meat, look, and look at the funny, don't give me that funny look on your face. What are you grinning about? Well, of course, then it would be off. The whole bit. You know. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, he, he learned early in the game to stay under the daybed because the daybed was so low that nobody could reach him under there. It was one of these, you know, like a Castro that falls out and it had these iron things on the bottom, and it, you had to be no, I would say you couldn't have made it under the daybed if you were any anything over three foot seven inches tall, and you couldn't weigh more than 26 pounds. And so he could get under there. He just wanted a thing like a cat going under a door, you know, zap, he'd go under. And boy, that would make my old man mad. You couldn't, have you ever had a dog or something that would get under something and you couldn't get him out? Well, my kid brother would spend weeks under the day, but they couldn't get him out, and they'd poke under there with it with with brooms. <laughs> I'm like, get out! <laughs> I don't know why I tell you this, but <laughs> they'd poke. You know, it's, you'd hear a whimper under there, at the, trying to get him out under there. Well, the <laughs> so nevertheless, there I am. See, so these these uh, this is not the embarrassing moment I was about to tell you about. I don't know. You know so so I I. I I had kept going into the office. See, I was in the office a great deal during a certain period in my my uh, my scholastic days. Let's put it that way. Oh, one of the worst ones I ever had happen to me that way. Have you ever been actually turned in by a total fink? Have you ever had anybody? It was that, that, I think, is one of the most traumatic things in your life, to trust somebody and get turned in. Oh, what a talk about a finky thing. I, uh, Schwartz and I used to hitchhike to school all the time. And uh, I, I, I must have clocked, I probably in my lifetime, I've clocked 20,000 miles or better hitchhiking. And we used to hitchhike to school. See, the reason we did it was because we were given money. You know, bus fare? Yeah, we would ride the school bus. And you had a, you have tickets and all that. Well, we would turn in our tickets at the office and collect money for them. And, and instead, we would hitchhike. Well, about once out of every six or seven days, we would simply miss. We wouldn't make it. We'd be like a half an hour late. Well, invariably, what we would do, Schwartz and I had a technique. We would come to school. It was late. You know, we'd like arrive a half an hour late. Well, we, you don't go into school, that's it. So we, we knew that if you went to school, you, the, the jig was up. So we would go down around the back of the school to this garage. They had a school garage back there, a lot of old cars, you know, trucks and stuff back there. And we would hang around this garage, and it was this, this old guy that was back there. And, uh, yeah, he was, he was just an old garage mechanic. So we'd go back there and we'd hang around with him, saying, well, one day, I'm back there in the garage with this guy and Schwartz, and the two of us are writing a note. I am writing a note to Schwartz's advisor saying that the reason Schwartz couldn't come to school that morning was because his sister was sick and he had to go to Alaska or someplace to get the serum and uh, he couldn't come until noon. 
So that way we would go back in school at noon. Everything's cool. See, this is about 10 o'clock in the morning. So I'm back there writing this note. And Schwartz is writing a note for me. Now, this is the only time in my life we ever worked the fake note bit. I never did it again. Nor had I done it before. Now, this is a common enough bit, you know, writing the fake note. So Schwartz figured, well, if he wrote my note, they wouldn't know my, you know, they wouldn't know Schwartz. My advisor was a different advisor from Schwartz's. His advisor would not know my handwriting and vice versa. So he writes this, dear Miss Snyder, the reason Jeannie is late for school today is because his father had a very bad illness last night. And Jeannie had to go to get the various things we needed for him this morning from the drugstore. I hope you will excuse him. It will not happen again. Signed, Mrs. Shepard, you know. So he writes this down, and I write down the thing about, you know, the dear Miss, his, his advisor by there was Miss M.E. Scott. Dear Miss Scott, the reason my son Schwartz is not uh, on time today in school is because his sister was very ill last night. And he had to go, you know, I write this thing out. And uh, and at that point, see, this guy is sitting there and he says, uh, he's laughing. He's helping us write the notes and stuff. Well, so I give Schwartz his note. Here, I got my note. Well, we both go up to, it's it's noon now. We have our lunch. We're sitting out there eating our salami sandwiches and stuff and peanut butter. Schwartz loved, incidentally, a very curious sandwich, which uh, even at that time, I never got the guts to try. And he really ate this. You're going to think I'm making it up. He honest to God ate this. He loved it. I don't know whether you've ever tried this because I have, a, I have completely uh, avoided this particular sandwich, but he loved it. He used to eat it every day. He used to take white bread, you know, sandwich. His mother would make, you know, his white bread sandwiches with peanut butter on them, sliced bananas, and you won't believe it, ketchup. Now, I have never tried, and Swartz loved it. He'd sit there and eat these things. And, and, and of course, maybe that was the reason his growth was stunted. That, that a lot of, you know, there were a lot of theories around why all the rest of us were bigger than Schwartz. But it could have been those sandwiches now, come to think of it. So Schwartz is eating this peanut butter glop and sitting there and we're talking away. And uh, it's, you know, we're having a great time. We're in the garage with this old guy that we, you know, we were old friends. We were, we'd been in the garage. We hung around the garage for like two years. And and so at that point, I go upstairs. It's, you know, the bell rings. It's it's after lunch now. We've sat in there for about three hours. The bell rings. We go charging up. And I go into my home room, which we always went into for 10 minutes after lunch before, for announcements and stuff, before the afternoon's classes started in the school I went to. So I go charging her real happy, you know, and I got my note. And I run up to Miss Snyder, and Miss Snyder didn't even, didn't even say a word. She just looked at me and says, would you please go see Mr. Rupp? What the hell is this? She didn't even take the nothing. Said, what the? So, well, you know, it's obviously a clerical mistake. So I go down to Mr. Rupp's office. I figured that you know, it's just one of those things that gets straightened out. And I walk in, and Rupp is sitting there. He's handed over, please. That's right, right. He says, the note that Mr. Stanford watched you write. It's Mr. Stanford. Who is it? He says, Mr. Stanford of the garage. The Fink. The Fink. He had called Miss Snyder. And and I was sitting in the in the office here. My I could just feel my face is white, you know. And the door opens, and who walked in? Yes, sir. That was another three day sentence in a slam. Boy, did hell break out loose that time. And the old man again says, you stupid, you wrote a note in the garage at a school? That's what but. I mean, he can understand writing a note to get out of school, but right then in the garage, see, he, he, he was always saying, what kind of a stupid kid had he given birth to? What kind of stupid he created? Remember sitting there, you know, and he, he got so furious, you know, he spilled his beer and everything else. He's mad. He says, you wrote a note in the... Oh, look what you made me do. I spill my beer. Yes. What? You mean once again the horn blows at midnight? You know what I turn into when that bugle goes, don't you? Oh, my God, please. And before your very eyes. 
Well, I'll tell you this. I, I, uh, I'm sorry I had to, uh, I'm sorry I had to, uh, not finish the story about the embarrassing moment. I cannot tell you now. Except to say it involved that damn swan and a Butterfinger candy bar that caused the two of us to have one of the most embarrassing moments I have ever had in public. And I will not pursue the story any The swan that lived in the lobby of the Oriental Theater amid all the uh, spearmint gum wrappers. Wrigley spearmint gum. You don't want to hear the rest of it because this story, ha if it's going to be told, it has to be told with full embellishment. Suffice it to say, kids, the swan is among, is among the meanest of creatures known to God's great, great world of fauna. I can say nothing good about swans. And I might point out before that night, I kind of dug Butterfinger candy bars. That night, I swore off them for life. Haven't had one since. I gave up Butterfinger candy bars and swans. I might also add double dates as a result of that night. Now I travel a lonely path. Yes, sir. I do not double date. No hanky-panky with swans. And if there's any candy bars involved at all, it may be an occasional powerhouse bar. <laughs> How long has it been since you've seen a powerhouse candy bar? Boy, that was a tooth rotter. Bring it up, babe. We're about to close up the station here at WBJC-FM. It's about eight minutes before midnight. Midnight is when we go off the air. <laughs> 